what was there like another room that people thought you were going to be in or something? No, they had scheduled somebody. Somebody, somebody marked a different meetup on their Google Calendar in this room, but they didn't. They aren't here, so. How exciting! Was maybe just a mistake. Okay. So you don't need anyone to run around putting signs anywhere. No. Okay. Cool. Great. Thank you, though. Sure. Perhaps they will. <laughs> All right. So it's fun. Sorry. Um, <coughs> I'm Brian Lane. I'm Brian Lane. I work for Wikimedia Foundation. I'm an operations engineer. I'm the lead for Wikimedia Labs. Um, who here is already familiar with what Labs is? Okay, well, they'll be more familiar hopefully at the end of this. Um, <clears throat> Wikimedia Labs is a virtualized environment and it's meant to um, empower our community to make changes to our site, uh, site's infrastructure in the same way that you would make changes to the sites themselves. Um, the initial scope of this was um, for us to have a testing and development environment. Um, in the early days of Wikipedia, all of the, the sites were built um, by volunteers completely. They had root access and they built everything from the hardware to the software stacks and the infrastructure and brought everything together. Um, as time has gone by, um, it becomes it became harder for us to continue giving out root access to volunteers. Um, and in fact, we haven't even given out shell access to a volunteer in quite a while on the production sites. And so um, the initial scope kind of uh, merged or changed from being um, just a test and development environment for the staff to also being an environment that we can use to mentor and bring in um, community operations people so that we have the ability to give people um, access without actually giving them full access. <clears throat> um, as time went on, we also I have modified the scope of the project um, to include a tool server replacement. Um, it was not initially meant to be a complete replacement of the tool server, but a separate environment, but now it is going to be the path for tool server. Um, <clears throat> In the future, we also intend to add some uh, research elements to this, um, further access to our analytics infrastructure and um, access to do queries and things like that um, so that you can do um, research in this environment as well. Um, going more to the point of mentoring, um, so there's a concept called um, a ramp for developers. And the idea is that you start them off with something very simple and easy and very approachable, um, something like writing a bot or a tool. Um, and so inside of Labs, we have these concepts of projects, which are community-based um, organizations where you can maintain sets of infrastructure. Some of these are very easy to use, like tools, which we'll pull and go into in a second. Uh, and then there's ones that are harder. You can have your own project, or you can be you can join other projects that um, may take more effort or experience level, specifically. Um, and in these, you do infrastructure-related tasks, you might do development or, or uh, such, but you're working as a community. Um, so the idea is you, we start people off in a much easier, approachable environment, we mentor them so that they can um, become more experienced users of our community and help with other projects as well going all the way to our deployment prep project, which is a clone of our production site. It's called Beta, if you've ever gone to it, on uh, wmflabs.org. And um, this is a full clone of our infrastructure with all of the clustered infrastructure, all of the deployment issues that we have. It's much more difficult to use, but at the same time, that our goal is to have people make um, operations changes and actually have them pushed out to the cluster. So having this ramp makes things much easier. So labs itself is, like I mentioned, a, um, a set of projects. But what it really is, is it's an infrastructure for building infrastructure. So the infrastructure itself is labs. Um, the colors here indicate um, the support level that is offered in these different things. So the infrastructure itself that's meant to build infrastructure is fully supported um, to the same level of support that the Wikimedia projects themselves are, which is full operations team support. Um, inside, of, inside of labs, though, we have these projects, which are in themselves sets of infrastructure. Tools, for instance, is a large number of virtual machines with a whole bunch of other resources that go along with it, and those need to be um, supported like other things. 
And this, uh, like that project, for instance, is what we consider semi-production. So we have uh, staff members, um, Andrew, um, Corin, and myself, that are dedicated to keeping this running and um, accessible for users. And we also have uh, community support within this as well. Then we also have some projects that are just fully community supported. Operations team members do not support the projects at all. Um, these would be kind of like development projects or, um, or infrastructure projects where people are doing tests and running things. But if something goes down in that, we don't um, respond. So this is kind of just showing that um, when you have an account, you have an account everywhere. Um, you don't have to register new accounts for every individual project. Um, when you make an account on Wikitech for labs, you get an account, and then when you need to be added to another project, someone just says, add, and you're in. And then you have immediate access to all of the resources inside of it. <coughs> this is kind of the anatomy of a project. A project, like I mentioned, is for building infrastructure. And inside of this, the heart of this is the instances, which are virtual machines. Um, you can build a number of virtual machines, just like you would in if you had like a data center or something like that with real hardware. Um, <clears throat> with the instances, there's a number of shared services behind this that are automatically kind of set up for you. So uh, for instance, there's shared storage. Home directories are shared between all of the instances. Same thing with uh, the data project share, which is a much larger set of storage. At this point, we have roughly, I think, 32 terabytes of storage available there. Um, <clears throat> And access to these projects is maintained by something called uh, security groups. Security groups are sets of firewall rules, really, that you can apply to virtual machines inside of your project that protect your resources from the outside world and from other projects. But the, the concept behind this is that you can have projects that interact with other projects. So you can set up your security group to say, I want this um, HTTP service to be available to members of these projects, and it just applies automatically. Um, as well as that, there's also um, floating IP addresses, where you can allocate a public IP address, and you can associate it to a virtual machine, so that from the outside world, users can access your resources. Um, you can take that IP address, and you can move it between servers, or instances. So if, for instance, you wanted to um, bring up a new service that's the exact same as another service and you just wanted to switch the traffic to it, you can just move it. And similarly, you can add DNS um, names to these IP addresses so that they can be accessible by normal means from the outside world. Um, all of this, of course, still goes through security groups like everything else. Um, in addition, we have MySQL replicas. These are replicas of our production databases for all the projects, all seven slices. That includes you know, commons and um, I will we'll log in as well. That's on. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and soon Wiki Voyage, I think. And soon w Wiki Voyage, yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so this is all of the projects. Um, it has filtered data access, but Cord will go into this more. But this was originally put in for Tool Labs, but it's accessible to any project inside of Labs. This is the infrastructure behind Labs. Um, all of these different things are individual services that are running that make all of this work. I'm not going to go into detail on this because it's fairly complex. <laughs> um, but the, the kind of concept behind this is that we have this infrastructure done in this way so that everything that you do is automated. We, you, there's no reason for, for most of the time for us to have to manually intervene in anything you're doing. You get to do everything yourself. You maintain everything yourself. And along with this concept, it also has um, support for like horizontally scaling the architecture. So. Um, from your perspective, you create resources. You don't worry about the limitations that, um, that you may be imposing on us. You build things, you do what you're gonna do, we take care of everything else. Uh, if you're using too many resources, we may have a talk with you um, to see if we can um, make your processes more efficient so that you use less resources. But if you have a need to have as many resources as, as you're using, we'll just buy more hardware. And so the concept behind this is, uh, these are like virtual machine nodes. Everything runs virtual machines. So um, it launches virtual machines on hosts. And if we need to have more virtual machines, and our hardware is, uh, we're running out of hardware resources, we just add another node. New virtual machines start popping up in the new nodes. So we have the ability to just add infrastructure at any point in time. So 
use the resources you're going to use. And with that, I'm going to pass this to Forum, who is the Tool Labs lead. pretty blue background. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Mark. Uh, I am an operational engineer with the foundation and I'm the tool lead, uh, I'm the lead for the Tool Labs sub-project, you could say. Uh, in fact, I'm the entire team. Um, and uh, that's, this is what we're going to be talking about. Now, most people here have heard of it as a tool server replacement. And I don't think it's very nice to say it this way. It's not meant to replace anything. It's meant to um, um, I think the proper word is to take over the, re the relay. I mean, the baton has been passed, and we're now providing a brand new infrastructure. Um, and the, what is the Tool Labs? The Tool Labs, basically, it's a place where you can run tools. It's that simple. Uh, the idea is that we're giving you an environment uh, where we take care of the system administration so that you can do your development. Now, you've heard Ryan describe the infrastructure behind the tool labs, which is the labs proper, and probably something that you notice is that it's fairly intricate. Um, basically, it does give you the resources to start your own infrastructure, but that requires you to do your own system administration. And most people who want to contribute, most community developers, don't want to have to become sysadmin just to write a box. And that's perfectly understandable. And that's the niche that tool labs is there to, uh, to, uh, to fill. So it's a reliable, scalable environment for community developers, but it runs in on WMF hardware in WMF data, uh, data centers. So it has access to our resources. Uh, it is supported by both ops from the, from the staff and from community volunteers. Uh, it is designed around the need of the projects. Basically what we did is we made an inventory of what kind of tools there are, what are people trying to do with the projects, and then we try to fill all the infrastructure needs so that they can run. Um, and why do we do this? Well, because it's a very simple thing. If you look at any of the projects, um, they all rely on a number of bots to automate processes, on uh, to provide maps for articles, to uh, provide tools for administrators, for check users. All of the projects have grown to depend on these things. And because they depend on them, it means that in order for the projects to succeed, then they must be reliable, they must be able to keep running, they must not depend on too many external things. So uh, we've made a place so that the tools can be supported, that they have the hardware and the resource. But also because the maintainers need the support. Uh, every one of the volunteers that provide a tool need to be able to do their work and like not have to fight uphill in order to find hosting for their tool or run it on their own laptop or anything like that. Uh, plus, we had expertise, which we're more than happy to share to help them make their tools and in some case progress further, perhaps make it into an extension or have it included into core functionality. Having a tool is often a very good first step. And finally, we're sharing resources with the rest of the foundation hardware, which means we have like, more power. Like Ryan said, everything is meant to be horizontally scalable. If we have a new incredible uh, research project or, or a new tool that consumes a lot of resources but brings a lot of value to the project, we'll just add more hardware. We want these things to exist and to be supported. So the design objectives, um, when I got the, the, the um, uh, mandate to design tool labs, basically the idea was we need something that is first reliable. Uh, we want that if the English Wikipedia depends on, uh, on a particular bot for its process, we need to be able to make sure that it's going to still be there in six months, it's still going to be there in a year. Uh, same things if uh, uh, Commons needs something to sort images and not realize on a tool to do so, it needs to still be there in two years, in three years. It has to be scalable because, well, more and more people do things and the projects depend on more and more tools. And finally, it must be simple. Um, the worst possible thing that we could 
demand from our community volunteers is that they have to learn all these different new things which are not directly related to what they're trying to do. We don't want you to have to become system administrators just so that you can run a, a Python bot. Um, so we provide features. Those are things that the Tool Labs gives you. Uh, we, have, we support web services. Uh, basically, if you need a web interface or you report things through graphs or things like that, we provide the, 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 um, the servers. Uh, it supports bots, things that runs continuously and needs to run continuously. We support batch jobs, I mean, things that need to be run once a month, perhaps for gathering statistics or for analytics. Um, we want things to be self-serve. We do not want you to have to rely on waiting on an, one of the member of the staff just so that you can start working. Um, we'll go into detail later, but for the most part, you can simply log in, start working, and we're not going to get in your way. Uh, you have access to the databases. That's one of the more important features. Um, and we have, a, like I said, the web server, and we've got a lot of redundancy. Everything is designed so that it's as, as reliable and scalable as possible. Um, tool maintenance can be shared. Now, we'll go into detail why that's so important later, but the basic idea is that you don't have a tool. You create a tool and then you can invite other community members to join you into maintaining or expanding that tool. It is basically the wiki process applied to development. Um, we've got a grid engine for dispatching jobs. You don't have to do resource management yourself. You have this thing, you want it to run, the grid engine will find a place to run it and it will run. Um, we have a web proxy uh, that provides logs. There are none of mice so that you actually respect the privacy policy, which means that we don't have to have a special, a different policy just for tool apps. It is bound by the same privacy policy as all of our third projects, which means that you can safely link to the tool labs from the projects without making any surprises for the users. Um, we have shared file system, that's actually part of what the labs provide. Uh, we've got time travel, which is very helpful. If you make a mistake, you can actually say, oh no, I want it like it was yesterday, and you can do that. Uh, and everything has been designed to make your lives easier. Um, we are not adverse to installing things that just that's convenience. For instance, we didn't start out with Mosh. And then uh, some of our, uh, of our users who are in further geographical area and the latency is a little high said, well, Mosh would really help. Okay, we gave them Mosh. Um, there are rules, of course. We're providing this infrastructure. There are some rules to be found. Um, open source. That is the primary rule of the tool labs. Everything that goes on the tool lab, that runs in the tool lab, that is made on the tool labs, must be open source, open data. This is a fundamental value of the foundation, and we want everything that you do to be reusable, to be uh, expandable by other people, to benefit other people. Yes? Um, if you make an API request to Google Maps, that's not entirely open data, but it's not stored on the server itself if you're only processing that data once. Strictly speaking, um, the question is, uh, how about using, for example, uh, Google Maps, which is not quite open. Um, our rules specifically prevent this as a basis. However, um, the, the actual text of the rules, I'll point you to them later, says that we can make exceptions. Uh, it, it does need to be cleared by our legal, legal department, and it's on a case-by-case -case basis. But there are cases where uh, the interest of the projects would be best served by uh, making an exception for a rule, and we don't reject them out of hand. Of course, we would much rather you use OpenStreetMap than a Google Maps, mm -hmm. if you could. Uh, if you can't, and there's something to be gained for the projects, we can discuss an exception. Those are the basic rules. In principle, everybody should follow them, but the interests of the projects, of course, go first. Um, don't be a dick. That's the simple way of saying don't break things either for other tool lab users or for people outside the tool labs. Um, and private information needs to be handled carefully, if at all. Yes? Could you say a little bit more about what open data means in this context? I mean, I got some user databases on tool labs. Are they by default publicly available? And should uh, excuse I me, user what? I had some, some, some uh, helpful 
uh, user databases on tool labs uh, because my tool requires some information that needs to be pre-computed. But it's also is that information that is already publicly available to other users of tool labs and, and should I make it available under some kind of license? You should like make it available. Um, the basic principle is that data that goes into your tool or data that goes out, that, that leaves your tool should be published open a suitable open license. Um, we don't want to create a, a, a funnel by which data becomes proprietary simply by virtue of having gone through the tool. Now, in practice, something that is used only internally in the tool, that is a database that you create for yourself, you don't actually have to publish it. But in practice, it's probably a good idea to make it available to the other members of the tool project because they might be able to help you with it. They might be able to suggest improvement and things like that. So I should say that your, your data does have to be appropriately licensed, though. Um, otherwise, if someone else needs to take maintenance of your, your tool or bot, um, they would not be able to with the data that is, uh, with data that's proprietary anyway. Right, you, you don't have to publish it, but it does have to have an open data license. Um, private information, and this is important, needs to be handled carefully, if at all. Now, in practice, on tool labs, you hardly ever get access to private information. Um, even the uh, web connections to you are sanitized and anonymized so that um, people don't need to worry that you're storing things that you shouldn't. This doesn't mean you can't collect it by other means. Now, there is, it is permissible in, when it's necessary for the tool to collect some private information with a suitable disclaimer. You need to warn the user that you're doing so and you need to explain what you're doing with the data and how long you're going to keep it. The actual text of the rules, which I'm going to point at you later, give the detail. Um, but we always ask that you do this as little as possible. Uh, we don't want to give nasty surprises to our users, and you, you are bound by the Wikimedia Foundation privacy policy. So there are a number of things that you simply cannot do. You cannot give the data to any third party, for instance. Um, except in new cases of research, but the policy, the privacy policy gives the detail of that. You have to obey it. Um, so that's what Tool Labs is. Now, most of you are probably interested in, okay, how? And how is actually fairly simple. Um, Wikitech.wikimedia.org. This is the primary URI you want to remember. This is the portal to everything labs. Uh, it's also the portal to a lot of things production, but as far as you're concerned, the primary interest there is everything that is labs goes through Wikitech. Um, you want to create an account there where you will be able to pick a shell account name, and this is going to be your identity for every labs project, including two labs. Um, you want to put your SSH key in your account preferences. It's a tab in preference. It's a wiki. Uh, and once that is done, you will automatically get a request for shell access in general, and you can request access to the tool labs at, uh, there's a new URI, there's a, a, a link here. But don't need to you don't need to remember this. On Wikitech, on the sidebar, there is a link to tool labs that is going to give you pointers to everything you need to know. Um, so the big picture, how does tool labs work? Now you have access, how, what, how do you work? Um, just quickly, there are four big components. <coughs> we have the bastion hosts, which are basically places your SSH to and do your work. There's the grid, which does the actual processing. There's a web cluster for serving web requests. And there are databases. They are not actually part of tool labs, but they were made for tool labs. Um, and um, uh, I still didn't find, uh, there's a pretty picture over there. I didn't put the picture in the slides because I'm stupid. <coughs> So the Bastion hosts, um, they're basically, they're SSH, they're open to SSH. You, if you read old labs documentation, they will tell you about going uh, onto a host named Bastion and from there going to your project. That remains true, but it is not necessary for the tool labs. The only really thing, the only thing if you're only going to do tools is toolslogin.wmflabs.org and toolsdev.wmflab.org. You can SSH to those with the key that you gave on Wikitech, and you will be granted access. Now, there is no technical difference between login and dev. They're both identical, uh, and they both have exactly the same things installed. 
The only thing is that we request that people who do things that are computationally expensive or that take a lot of resource do it on dev so that people on Dashlog can have uh, a good interactive performance. But they are otherwise functionally identical. Um, the grid is the meat of the tool apps. It's, uh, it's an open grid engine, which is basically uh, SGE, Sun Grid Engine, uh, which is now Oracle Grid Engine. Um, and the principle is really, really simple. You have a program, you have a script, and you say, run this somewhere. And what the grid does is it finds a host with sufficient resources, schedules that to be run, and then gives you the result back. Um, one of the things it can do, it can do this synchronously. So you say, run this now, and I'll wait for the result. Or you can, you can say, run this whenever you have the time and give you the result when you're done. And it supports both one shot, you just start this, it's done, and continuous thing. Now, continuous programs are interesting. This is what you would use for box, for instance. It basically says, run this where there is room. By the way, it's not going to stop. And if it does stop, I want you to restart it. Um, this has a number of interesting things. It means that um, you have automatic redundancy built in. If the server on which it was going, one of the computer crashes, the grid engine will simply find another node and start it there. So your bot will keep working unless all of labs is down. And I can tell you for a fact that we'd know and we'd fix it really, really fast. Um, there's a web cluster. Basically, there's a proxy that dispatches, a, uh, that dispatches thing to a number of identical web servers, and you can put contents on those web servers. Uh, it can be scripts, it can be output from your jobs. Uh, basically, you've got a public HTML directory in which you can put whatever it is you need for your tool. Um, we do SSL, so you don't have to. Uh, by definition, every tool is accessible through SSL. You have to be careful. Um, I'm just giving this a <coughs> because SSL is one of the subject of the day. Um, don't specify the protocol in your own URE, uh, URLs so that you don't need to start switching between SSL and not SSL. Always use slash foo instead of HTTP slash foo. Um, everything is run through SUPHP, which doesn't just support PHP, which means that every tool runs under its own credentials. Uh, it doesn't run under your credentials as a user, which means the principal advantage of which is the tool does not depend on you being there and it does not depend on exactly just the one maintainer. As maintainers come and go, the tool remains. Uh, and we have uh, WSGI support planned really soon. In fact, I think UV is in the room. Yes, he's the one who's currently working on this. Um, and then there are the databases, which is probably what most people want to have access to. Um, we've got two sets of database. There, there are the database which are a copy, a replica of what's in production. That's the actual project databases. And we've got project local databases, which is basically database for your own use, where you can stuff your data for your own application. Um, all the project databases are replicated with access level that is exist, ex well, pretty much exactly equivalent to that of a registered user. Now, what this means in practice is that um, suppressed information is already scrubbed out, so is any privately, uh, private information like IP addresses, uh, password hashes, of course, and all of this information. Any information that you have in there has already been sanitized, so by definition, you're, you cannot violate the privacy policy by using that data. Um, you can create databases, users and tools can create databases at need. So if you have something that needs to create one database for every project, you don't need ops intervention to do this. You can actually have your tool create them or do them yourself. And you, like I said, we have project local databases. Sorry, those are perfect when you don't need to interact with the replication databases. You can simply create a database in the project local database. It's your database. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, tool accounts. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Do you also replicate the text tables? Uh, the question is whether we also replicate the text table. Uh, no, we do not. Okay. Uh, it's not because we do not want to give access to the text, but because it turns out that not only is it huge and would consume an enormous amount of resources, but it would actually be slower to access text 
directly through the database. Because of the way they are stored, you're actually going to get faster results fetching tasks through the API with an HTTP request than you possibly could by talking directly to the databases because of all the caching that is um, involved. In the case of the database, um, there are also issues about suppressed revisions which are, would have been extraordinarily expensive to purge uh, and would have slowed down access greatly. So no, there, it's not that you can't access the text or that you're not allowed to serve it, that used to be an old boost server rule. It's just that it would actually be counterproductive to give you access to that data directly through the database. But you can fetch, since you can fetch the revision numbers from the database, fetching the actual text through the API is a simple HTTP round trip. Um, uh, Sorry, another one? Yes. Uh, what kind of lag do you get today? Uh, excuse me, what kind of? Lag. Oh, you mean replication lag? Yeah. It's usually under half a second. Um, the database, well, first of all, it's in this, it, it, it is basically in the same network, so that we do have a great deal of gain in performance by not having to ship it overseas. Uh, but also the database, the, replica, uh, the replicas, have been designed especially for that use in mind, and our DB specialists make sure that performance was, uh, I'm told, really, 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 really good. Um, I, I don't do heavy database processing myself, but uh, I remember the original reactions were, oh my god, this is so fast, uh, mostly because it's on SSD. So read access, which is the only thing that people will do with a replica database, tends to be really, really fast. Uh, anything else? Mm. Good for now, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tool accounts. Uh, tool accounts is an interesting concept. Uh, I think Actually, Ryan skipped a bit about no, sure yeah. this time. Yeah, yeah. Um, tool accounts is a concept for the tool labs, where basically anything that is a tool that is meant to run continuously, that is meant to have a web service, has an identity separate from that of its maintainers. Now, those of you familiar with the tool server are probably aware of something they call uh, multi-maintainer projects. Now, this is pretty much the same concept. It's not implemented quite the same way, but it's pretty much the same project. So um, rather than have this as the exception, this is the only way you can make tools in tool apps. Um, it, it is a simple process. You don't even have to, uh, um, to ask any of us. You simply go on the web interface and say, create new tool. It's that simple. Um, and the idea being that one tool has, does not have a one-to-one -one mapping with its maintainer. If you, there are three of you who are maintaining a tool, even if, or if there are even just one of you, what you do is that you create the tool and the members are maintainers of the tool. They can switch to the tool account and they have rights to read, write, whatever the tool does. But this list is dynamic. You can add and remove people at need. And um, um, it, it's not a one-to-one -one map in either direction. One tool account can have a number of small related tools that all work well together and have one set of maintainers. Um, so. Uh, in, in, as far as technical implementation is, is done, uh, a service group is a separate UID and GID. It's a Unix user uh, that is global to the entire two labs, but local to that project. So it's not known to other projects. And all the maintainers are simply Unix member, uh, members of the Unix group and have the rights to sue to that user. Uh, and like I said, so any number of services under one banner. It's not a one tool, if you have two web well, two web interfaces that do pretty much the same thing, you can bring them into one account or separate them. That's pretty much your call. Um, and when to use tool accounts, because you do have rights of user, but whenever you want to run something that runs unattended, we request that it be done through a tool account. You should not run things in a screen session uh, or in, in your own contact. Uh, there are a number of reasons for this. No, the number one reason is that if we depend on the tool and you go and the tool runs under you, we are never going to take over your account. We're never even going to look into your account unless like, there's there some dire system administrative emergency to do so. So we don't want you to have stuff that is publicly accessible in your personal account. It's kind of counterproductive. Um, and there is, no, it, there is no cost to having tool accounts. I mean, if you have seven tools, you can create seven tools accounts and manage them in any which way you want. What's important is that it is not your personal account to do so. 
Um, and think of the orphans. That is the primary reason why we don't want you to do things under your own account. <coughs> Our tools are things that the projects depend on. Um, you need to be able to hand it over to someone else. And you obviously won't be handing over your own credentials. Um, you need to be able to share maintenance if you get tired of maintaining it or if you get hit by a truck, the good old proverbial truck. But it also means that if somebody, if a tool gets abandoned, gets orphaned, it is now possible to restore it to new maintainers. New community members can take them over. And uh, I'm, I'm saying this here. We don't know the rules for that yet. It hasn't happened yet. Obviously, the tool labs is too young to have abandoned tools. Uh, but we do know for a fact that it's never going to be against your will. We're never going to take away a tool away from an active maintainer. It's really just a matter of how to resurrect a tool that's broken because there are no maintainers anymore. And we also know that it's not going to be fast. It's not a question that, oh, we sent an email to the maintainer yesterday. He didn't say anything. Here, it's yours now. Uh, it, it's, we're talking about weeks, at least, and probably months, and never again a maintainer will. It's, a, it's an insurance policy. It's not a way to take tools over. And anyway, remember the first, first rule of Tool Labs. Everything has to be open source. Everything has to be open data. Push comes to shove. The worst case scenario, we can simply fork. Everything you had was open source. We can simply make a copy and give it to a new maintainer. So we're always safe, but it's much easier for everyone involved if we can simply keep the same tool going so that we don't have to go over all the projects and change your eyes, create new bot accounts and things like that. Um, ooh. There we go. Um, and, well, not only will be holding a workshop, we are holding a, ho a workshop uh, to help you around to a labs. Um, again, that's a ugly URI you do not need to memorize. If you go on Wikitech, there's the Tool Labs link in the sidebar, which leads you to a landing page with everything you need to know about. And we are here to help. There are lots of resources. First of all, there's, there's the, um, uh, the staff, me, Ryan, and Andrew, who are around the conference all the time uh, for, for the, at least the next day and a half. Uh, you can hit us up you can ask us questions. But on IRC, Found Wikimedia Labs on Freenode is the place to be. Uh, there's always people there, and everyone is really, really helpful, and you can and you can reach us this way easily. And Labs L at list Wikimedia.org. That's the la official Labs list. It's low volume. You really, really should subscribe to it because every announcement, every maintenance is announced there first. And there's also a wealth of, of knowledge to be found there. If you have a really important a question you can't find the answer for, ask there, you will get an answer. Um, before we go to the questions, actually, um, wait, wasn't it Firefox? Safari. No, it's, there's no touch screen on this thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm too used to my iPad. Click. There, you go. there we go. Um, <coughs> that's that, that, that's actually that's WikiTech, uh, the main landing page for labs in general. Like I said, the one thing you really want to know that link over here to labs. Follow this link. Click, click. That's a good link. Um, <laughs> that link will bring you to the page where basically. Um, all the documentation is linked from this page. All the resources, you have to get access, the help page, the useful links, um, getting started in depth or for tools and server users. And uh, a lot of community members that have already migrated to the tool server have made documentation. They've documented how they did it, uh, what stumbling blocks they found, and, and all the problems they ran into. Learn from their experience. This is the best possible way to do this. And oh look, that's a pretty picture I wanted to show you, right there. So it's dessert. It's what it's dessert, right? It's dessert. So we got the replication databases as we were talking, the execution host that you don't actually worry about. You go into the login servers, login and dev, and when you ask for something to be scheduled, it simply shuffles off magically over there. 
with some black magic involved. And we've got the web servers here, which again, you don't need to worry about setting up web servers. You've got a, a public directory accessible. <coughs> Just put contents there and the web servers will serve it. Um, and uh, wait, I had more, I had more. Um, I wanted to, um, that's the actual, that's the web server of the Tool Labs. It also has all the links to all the interesting places. You might actually want to know this URL is tools wmflabs.org um, and uh, just to show off a little to like uh, make things uh, really clear those every one of those black, uh, blue blocks is one of the tools that has been moved up to now as you can see there's already a number of projects that I already have a number of maintainers and um, I'm going to show off some of them no no touch screen no touch screen <laughs> uh, not, not, not that one not that one that's cool, though. Yes, it is cool. Um, in case you were wondering, uh, this is what's currently running on the grid. Prism. <laughs> um, no, no, no. See, that one is running on the grid, but it's hidden. Uh, don't say that on video. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone knows that it's a joke, right? Um, so you're actually seeing the execution host right now. Yeah, everything you see here that is continuous running is a bot of some sort. How can the load be 141.2%? That's interesting. Uh, it's also fairly high at the moment where it was done. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, I'm not an ops person. I don't know how these things work. Uh, it's but it's but per core, so for yeah. most of yeah. machine. Yeah, uh, well, actually, um, that's a really interesting question. Uh, Sumana asked, why can load be over 100%? Load is actually an indication of how much stuff wants to run versus how much stuff, uh, how much CPU cores there are available. Oh, so it's kind of like a measure of backlog. Uh, it's kind of. At 100%, that means the CPUs are running all the time servicing requests. I'm oversimplifying here, but that's basically it. If the load is 141%, that means that there's about 41% for uh, an extra 40% of stuff that's currently waiting to run. Uh, it's actually fairly high. I'm, ooh. 98. I think it's time that we add more execution hubs. So this is how we do profiling? Is every whenever you do a tutorial, someone randomly asks and then? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, actually, uh, we just loaded this. I haven't seen this in, uh, in since the beginning of Wikimedia. And as you can see, uptake is now pretty nice. I think we're going to have to add more exec hosts. Basically because we have gotten people over the course of Wikimedia to use the tool labs. Exactly. <laughs> That's actually old. Right now it's like 30%. Oh, okay, so apparently somebody was doing something really, really heavy. All right. Uh, it happens. There are some jobs that are um, fairly dependent, and we do keep an eye on resources, and if you see resources lacking, say, hey, I need more resources, and we'll give you more resources. Like Ryan said, um, first we'll try to make sure that you're not overusing them, and if you're not, you need the resources, we'll give them to you. Uh, I wanted to show off two, actually, yeah. Projects, but I know I can see the other one. Okay. Um, which one is the full uh, is the, the plus. Uh, plus? It's an apple. I don't know apple. Uh, that's a schedule. We don't want that. Um, I wanted to show you uh, an example of a web tool. Um, Anagrim is something that runs on the French Wikipedia. This is actually interesting because it's actually two tools in one. The, it has a bot that um, that uh, uh, did I say French Wikipedia? Yes. I meant French Wiktionary. Uh, there is a bot that actually collects all the new contents, all the new linguistic information, and creates a database on the tool labs um, with uh, things like rhyming information and meter, and uh, as well as tesserus-like uh, functionality. And there's a web interface that allows you to look for things like. Um, uh, different ways of rhyming with it, uh, different synonyms, different tesserus. This is all user contributed contents made by collecting from the project and then presenting with a new web interface. Um, that's a very good example of a composite tool. And this is a tool that all of you know that I was already logging on, um, on the tool apps, is Geohack. Uh, Geohack, where basically you can click on coordinates in, uh, in info boxes uh, on articles, at least on the English Wikipedia, and I'm pretty sure a lot of other Wikipedias use Geohack. Um, that's a good example of an entirely web-based tool that functions 
on the tool apps, that is only possible because of the way we did the privacy policy. Um, there were some questions about how exactly you can do this and still respect the privacy policy. Since the web server doesn't see where the IP customer, the, the IP client comes from, that we can actually link directly from the project to there without affecting anything about the privacy policy. We don't need an intercential, we don't need a disclaimer, warning if you follow this thing, perhaps you're not going to be quite as, um, uh, uh, have the, quite the same privacy policy. This is a very good example of something that is tightly integrated with one of our projects and <coughs> bound by the same privacy policy. So I'm gonna go back to the actual questions time which one? Preview. This one? No. Preview. Yeah, preview. Wait, what? And, and preview. we're going to have some What's preview? This one? Yeah. yeah. Ah! <laughs> questions! <laughs> it's a Mac. Um, the US has a different approach to database rights, as in they don't have any, compared to Europe. Uh, again, with the Google Maps uh, mining of geo-coordinates, that would make that data not copyrightable um, um, and okay? I, I'm not entirely sure what you mean. Uh, she did ask, uh, what's her name? Vera. Vera? Vera. Vera, uh, Vera asks, um, given the differences in, in law between database rights, uh, for data, uh, copyright law for database, between Europe and the United States, um, what this would affect. Um, yes, it, it certainly would. I'm not a lawyer, and I would recommend that you ask this question from our legal department for a definitive answer. But from what I do know of copyright law, yes, it does mean that um, um, a database that is a simple collection of facts without a sophisticated algorithm to determine uh, order or things like that, as long as it's just hard work compiling it, mm -hmm. then under US law, it is generally not copyrightable. But this is a very difficult question. The case law is not entirely clear. I really recommend that you ask this question to our legal department. You can do so at legal at wikimedia.org. That will get to the right person and you'll get a definitive answer. I can only guess at it. Uh, any other questions? You could also send a list. I, I have, wait, wait, wait. Yes, we can also forward it on to the, the end. Wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know I forgot something. Are you a magician now? Is there a rabbit in there? No, there's no <laughs> rabbit. There's no rabbit. Oh, there we go. I have green tea Japanese candy. Oh. I said, any people who ask, <laughs> oh, you don't want it? Oh, okay. Well, anyone who asks a good question is allowed to, to have one. Okay, I'm going to give him the candy and then I'm going to amend this to anyone who has a relevant question. <laughs> yes, Sumana. Uh, I feel as though uh, it may be that I missed something, but uh, can you talk a little bit about plans for what other pain points you're going to be solving? in Tool Labs, like pain points you've heard of from Tool Labs users that you're like, you know what, here's what's next. Um, so did, did you have a future section that I missed? Uh, no, there is no future section that you missed. Um, Sumana asked whether we had any, well, I, I presume she's asking whether we have a roadmap for future expansion and, and future requests. Uh, not at this time. Um, I'm going to be honest. And at this point, we are in this stage where we expect to be coasting for two or three months while people do migration. Uh, and we don't want to change too many things at that point. And once we have a, a stronger user base, we'll have a better idea of what's missing, what new things we can bring in. So I have some things, though. Oh, to Ryan. Has yeah, some I figured um, you probably, you, I know you do have stuff. Ryan. I know you have stuff on your to do list. So. Yeah. Quite a few things on a to do list. Yeah. Um, of course, these aren't necessarily tools-specific things. Tools at this point in time is at a stage where I think it's mostly about growing the user base and, and helping people get their tools running. But um, from Lab's perspective, there are a number of things that we're working on right now. Um, UV is actually working on awesome stuff. Um, but it's mostly Lab-specific things. A lot of uh, interface changes that make the interface suck less. Um, 
making it easier to, and instead of having to get public IP addresses for every single thing you want to do, having a proper proxy um, service so that you can just ask for a proxy and it will give you a, a, a address to use for your instances. Um, a number of other things, but yeah, we, we'll, have, we'll post a roadmap soon. Um, it's about that time of the year when we're doing roadmaps, so um, hopefully we'll have one out in a couple weeks. And so I think I'd kind of like for maybe Silka or, or you to talk about, like, are there pain points you've heard about that you're like, you know what, this is a, a longer term thing that needs addressing? Um, well, SSH access. <laughs> yeah, and, and just the documentation is a little bit, it's, it's not, it's, there's a lot of information, but it's not, doesn't have, it's not organized around workflow, so. And we've worked on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. we did. But in large part, you'll want to come on IRC and have somebody talk you through it step by step because you won't necessarily see what the sequence of steps is directly from the box. Right. And also that the maps project somehow depend on each other and there's no like promised deadline until one this will be available. Um, and so there's open street map, well, wiki, mini, artwork, and I can at least give you a partial answer on that. Yeah. Um, the question, uh, or the, the statement there was about um, the deadlines on the maps projects, and that would be a database for um, OpenStreetMap, mm -hmm. for readable database for OpenStreetMap so that people can actually query against it. And also tile servers and um, associated things, since they're all connected. Um, the deadline for that is going to be before tool server is uh, decommissioned. So <laughs> that's the that's the hard deadline, right? So that's that's at least a partial answer. We do have an operations engineer working on this currently. It's Brandon Black, and Corin is working on um, adding a uh, open OpenStreetMap uh, database that is readable in Postgres. Yeah, the replication that is dependent on the uh, tool server and the uh, production computer. Yes. Yes. So, um, to answer Sumana's more general question about pain points, um, I think that at this point there are no major pain points. There are a lot of little things, of little requests, um, new tools that we hadn't considered, um, uh, new new requirements from tools that have just recently migrating or are in the process of migrating. Um, and it, it, I don't think that there are any of those which are considered to be hard problems. It's usually a matter of, oh, well, I need tool X installed. Yes, we'll install tool X, and a day or two later. Certain dependencies? Yeah, we're talking about dependencies. We're talking about slight configuration tweaks. Um, I believe that every major component, every principal service is up and running and appears to be adequate to fill the need of at least everyone that has already migrated to this day. So, um, that, that was relevant. You can, can the, I would actually awesome. like to ask questions to the audience. Is anyone, is anyone planning on migrating that does not have, uh, is that we're, we're not actually fulfilling your requirement currently? Can you ask it again? Uh, well, about, uh, it, it, oh, joins, I'm sorry. Go ahead. About joins between uh, the replicas and the user. Oh, that's yeah. that's a good point. I haven't mentioned this. Um, yeah, you mentioned, but you said that it's perfect not to join. No, I, yeah, I, I, I did mention it obliquely, uh, that there are databases where you can't do the joins, which is perfect when you don't need to. Yes, you can create databases on the replica databases, and you can do joins with the replica databases. The only thing that is slightly different, and it is documented as such, that is slightly different that from the tool server is that there isn't a copy of comments on every, on every uh, slice. Um, there is a copy of comments only on comments itself. However, we do provide a federated database that is a link to common and to Wikidata on every other slice. Um, Wikidata didn't exist by the time that this was set up for tool server, but it seemed to be a natural candidate for something that you might want to cross join with a project database. Uh, so Wikidata and Commons have federated databases on every slice where they don't live. Um, when you're actually on the Wikidata database, you don't actually need a federated database to reach it, obviously. Um, and you can do joins, you can do three-way joins if you want between your own database uh, whatever production database, whatever wiki database you have, and I have both uh, wiki data and commons uh, on those projects. There are caveats, they are documented. Um, it's a little trickier to get the query right so that it is just as fast as with the local databases. You have to be careful about properly using indexes. 
But beyond that caveat, the only inconvenient is one of performance. If you don't get it right, it's going to work. It's just going to be really, really slow. Uh, if you get it right, uh, I, I did some measuring. You're maybe losing about 10 or 20 percent performance compared to a local database. And given that this saves, this complete, this simplifies replication a great deal and makes it more robust. Uh, there was it, it was in question. I mean, we wanted to have something robust more than we wanted that 10 or 20 percent performance gain. So um, yes, you can do joins both with your databases, the project databases, and both uh, commons and wiki data from all shards. Uh, any other question? Any? Any? You, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> So you don't want to it's candy? pretty good. No. I actually no, like this candy good, yeah. more than I thought I would. No. So to rephrase my question, are there any features that we're currently missing that are blocking your migrations? I have a kind of question. How, you, how close are you to your goals in terms of reliability? Um, there's only one thing that's not very reliable right now, and that's shared storage. Um, we're currently working on it. Um, but otherwise, the reliability is, is fairly high currently. Um, actually, I'm going to give more details there. Um, there is a problem with storage at this time where we have what seems to be a hardware issue that causes stalls. Now what it does is that all file system access stops for about one or two minutes, a few times per hour at the most at the highest load and it's load related. It's annoying, but it doesn't break anything. This is our first priority to fix. Otherwise, and except for that issue, I believe that at least since Wiki, uh, since the um, hackathon, there has been no outages. So that's in the past two months? That's in the past two months. And given the fact that everything has been designed from the ground up with a great deal of redundancy, pretty much the only time where there will be complete outages that will stop services running on, on the labs, well, unless there's a fire in the data center, we can't protect against those, uh, is in the case where we have to do some maintenance on the file server, in which case it's going to be a planned maintenance we're going to be advising everyone well in advance of the outage and how long it's going to last. And even then, because of the grid engine, once the outage is, is completed, everything will restart immediately as grid, as grid nodes come back to life. So um, I think that we've pretty much reached the objective. Yes, Sumaya? Uh, I might sort of clarify, I think that uh, it was really, really useful to have that uh, chart that Ryan had presented about like, okay, here's the Venn diagram of production, semi-production, community supported. Um, I could imagine it also being useful to people to have a sense of service level agreement for uh, the top two. Obviously, there's none for community supported. We, right? Well, we don't, we don't have one of those for the sites either, so. I understand that. <laughs> um, I, I think perhaps what Suman is asking is what kind of, uh, of SLA analog we can expect from sure. different levels uh, of service. Uh, I think that past experience and, and best effort, what the expectation is reasonable to be, I think is 3.9 for production, right? 3.9 roughly for production. 3.9 roughly for production and 2.9 for semi-production. Um, the thing about semi-production is not that it is less important so much as there are fewer people assigned to it. So um, it, it will get the same amount of attention, just not for the, for the same, from the same amount of people. That, that's the primary difference. Now, I, I should expect that we can, on a good year, probably even reach higher than that. Certainly. But if you want to manage expectation, I think what you want to, 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 prevent, to, to, ha to have as expectation is that Two nine of, uh, of uptime is something we would qualify as a success. So, uh, from my perspective, as uh, you know, trying to take uh, the the viewpoint of a potential user, let me let me sort of get an idea. Maybe people who are uh, users and potential users of Tool Labs can help me understand whether I'm right in thinking. Here's what some expectations would be. One is pretty damn high uptime. Sounds like we have that. Um, another is clarity of expectations regarding if there is some kind of problem, who to report it to and how to get help for that. And third, if it's not just a problem affecting me, but it's a problem affecting everybody, how do I get like constant updates on the information on, on what's happening and, and when it will be fixed? Labs L. Say that again? <laughs> Labs L, the, the mailing list. We announce all, all things <laughs> on the mailing list and, um, and problems that people are having, they can 
write to the mailing list. People, if if it if it is not actually an infrastructure problem, other people will help. Will be able to help. If it is, then we will be able to help in that situation. We will be notified. Uh, I'm going to add to this one more thing, uh, and it's probably the most important thing to know. Um, the foundation has a bugzilla, mm -hmm. um, and. Everything that is reported, there is a component specifically for the two labs. It is, um, I think, unsurprisingly, labs, two labs? Yes. No. Yes, labs, two labs. It could be your labs. And, and every issue that is reported there is given attention and is updated. Um, sometimes it can be like for something like a, a new feature request. It can time, it take a little longer, but there are regular updates about where we are on it. If you, if you see an outage, I think the first thing to do is talk to Labs L and and, and Bogzilla. Well, I would ask, wouldn't you check status.wikimedia.org first? Mm, it's not on there. And that, would, that would actually be fairly difficult to track there. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if there is a broadcast type place where people can check for outage information. We, maybe we could add it to status. I don't think it'll be easy. That, okay. that, that sounds like a feature request to Madam. Okay. Perhaps you should open the Mozilla. I <laughs> I, but I wanted to check whether other people who are actually potential users, yeah. like, you know, I sort of want to take a straw poll here, why not, of like, okay, if you think there might be a big outage affecting tool labs, like, do you want to, like, check LabZell? Do you want to, like, have a web page you look at? Do you want, like, a push notification? What do you want? I actually, Sumana, I'm sorry. I just remembered something that's directly relevant. One of the community members is actually currently working on setting up an Isinga server for two, uh, for the two labs. So, uh, would yeah, that be UV? That's UV. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yes, he's doing this in, a, in his capacity as a volunteer. Yes. You were going to say something? Oh, no. Okay. Um, if you need immediate support, IRC is always good. We're generally always on. We have uh, <laughs> we have um, bouncers. So if we are not on, then we'll, we'll, notice. Notice, we'll notice it at some point when we get uh, back. And, and as far as labs, I, I already um, showed the IRC channel. I'm going to show it again. There we go. Uh, Wikimedia-Labs on Freenode. Not only are members of the operation team on that channel most of the time, but they are the uh, community system, system administrator of the two labs are also on that channel most of the other time. And I think we've, we're covering about 20 out of 24 time zones. Uh, so we've got pretty good coverage. There is someone that will be able to answer to your questions there at worst case scenario. And I, I, so I think you deserve a second, Kenny. Why, thank you. Uh, I, I feel as though I didn't actually get oh, the sorry. question asked of the room that I wanted to, though. <laughs> I'll, I'm, I'm generally going to repeat the question. Sure, go ahead. Ask question. Um, specifically, what are, you are all potential Tool Labs users, what are your expectations? What do you expect to be necessary in order to uh, uh, have this, the environment that you desire? Is there anything that we've missed? Um. More flexibility than a standard host when it comes to Apache versions and things like that? Um, interestingly enough, that's also solvable. The thing is, um, Tool Labs provides a fairly standard environment yeah. for the people who have fairly standard requirements. What's good for you for when you, you need to go outside those boundaries, then what is your solution? Is the labs proper? Rather than join the tools project, where you basically system administration is done for you, uh, you can simply create your own project or join another uh, uh, um, compatible project with what you need and do this there. Now, there's the trade-off. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, there's a trade-off. Tool Labs, you get system administration for free. Uh, your own project, you get to do your own system administration. Doesn't mean we won't help, but it's not, we're not going to be maintaining it. But if you need something different, if you do need to have a Tomcat, for instance, to serve uh, Java content, mm -hmm. you might. That's Some people do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not, not my kind of people. <laughs> uh, some people do. Uh, we don't supply this. Tool Labs does not provide that infrastructure. But there is nothing that prevents you from having a project to provide that infrastructure both for yourself and for other people who would need it. So I'd like to follow up on that. Yes. Um, so there is, not only can you, um, can you yeah. use like to completely move out of labs and set up your own infrastructure, 
but you could also just have pieces of your infrastructure in a separate project and access those pieces of infrastructure from inside of tools so that you will only have to do part of the work. And then you can also make that service available to others as well. It's, it's meant to be very community oriented. Yeah, that is how so the PostgreSQL database fall under this category? Um, in fact, it's even better than that. We have a new, two new database servers that we're actually currently setting up, and they are going to provide a PGSQL for um, all of labs. Um, it has a number of uses. You didn't like the candy, that's all right. Um, there are a number of uses for this, uh, and one of them, which is a really interesting use case, is actually testing MediaWiki against it. Awesome! <laughs> Uh, Yuvi, you were going to say something? Yeah, so to add on to the point about infrastructure, so uh, all of the stuff that runs tool labs is also in Puppet. So if you need a piece of infrastructure and you think that lots of other people can also use it, you can just work on it and add patches and get it deployed. So I needed Redis for some of my tools, uh, so I was able to just work with them and add a Redis uh, host deployed uh, via Puppet. And now everyone is able to use Redis, and I think that's like sort of a supported service now. Yes, uh, so if you need something, it is possible to get that done uh, by yourself, by actually writing code, rather than having to try to find someone with free time who has the rights to do stuff. So that is very powerful. Uh, we also have Tools Beta, which is sort of like tools, but lets you mess around a little bit more, so you can test these kind of infrastructure things. So if you think you need more infrastructure that like stuff that does not exist right now, you can sort of work on it yourself and get it with Adam. Okay, so uh, where's Isinga right now? Is Isinga it is on a page and nowhere else right now, because I'm just working on it my part time. So so we do have an Isinga kind of running right now too. Right. We have uh, one that uh, Peter Benna had created a, a long time ago. It's not. Um, it's the way that it's used is somewhat non-standard, um, so we're looking at ways to make that better. That's what UV is working on right now. So that's um, asinga.wmflabs.org. It's kind of it's basically on the roadmap in a fairly short term. We want to have monitoring, yeah. and now I realize I'm speaking. I shouldn't have taken a candy. <laughs> I didn't ask a question. I'm entitled. <laughs> uh, we also have Ganglia. It's ganglia.wmflabs.org if you want to see um, resources, uh, re how how your project is doing resource wise. And everyone can access ganglia.wmflabs.org. Yes. Yes. Oh, no touch screen. <laughs> Um, I, I'm sorry, I have, uh, I would love to hear more from other people about other things that they might be looking for, features, training. Is it, not, no, is it, not, is it possible to get some kind of analytics for each tool or for, for a tool that I made? You, you, I mean, you want there any free medical access to it counted for... Oh, analytics. Um, yes and no. Um, that is, most of the data you would get as a member of a tool project would be useless because it's been anonymized. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it wouldn't be that useful. Uh, you could possibly do a, a project of your own because then that means that you could actually deviate from the privacy policy, but then you need to warn your users that you're doing so. So, as a rule, this is not the best place to do something like this because of a privacy policy. And I think everyone here understands that this is one of the core values of foundation. Yes, right. So, um, analytics would be nice for certain things, and we probably should eventually do that, but make a display aggregate data for things like number of like accesses to a bot, or not to a bot, but a tool, so that we know which tools are the most access tools and things like that. But yeah, the word, yeah, the word analytics means lots of different things to yeah. lots of people. Yeah. I would love to talk with you more after about what it is you'd like to do, because there might be some uh, systems and stuff available that even the Wikimedia Foundation analytics group is making right now that you could actually make use of. Yeah. Um, so, so there's actually already an AWS task instance on tools. Oh, cool. Yes, uh, but like I said, it, it's more or less useless, except pretty much. Because all the data has been anonymized. Now, we're running a little late, and Zilka uh, has some things to say as well, so I think I'm going to leave the floor to her at this point. Yeah, um, I'll be quite short. I... Do you want to pick your thing? Ah, yes. Was it
can be that bad? I didn't. No. I didn't. Like <laughs> Silka, I'm sorry. I, I thought this was sort of all melding into one. It's okay. I didn't it's just I got to two or three things to say. That's all. Totally reasonable. Aw. My words. Get up. <laughs> okay. Um, so you know, uh, which of you actually have tools on the tool server right now? A lot. Okay. So uh, you, you know that the supposed deadline to migrate, yeah, to yeah. migrate is in the middle of next year. Yeah, at the end of June would be the plan. So we have a few months to take care of the hardware questions and so on, which are still open, by the way. If you have ideas. Uh, I'm sorry. Us. Take care of in what sense? Uh, like think about what will happen to it. Okay. Don't it? So probably donate, right? Some put put to wear. Okay. As opposed to hitting things with hammers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. We, we generally donate. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, that would be thirtieth of June, and please. Just so you know, you're not actually predicting. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I like seeing this. It's, it's a pretty picture. <laughs> okay. But, uh, it's the GitHub octopus. Yeah. I mean, it's, I guess we could try to figure out how it's thematically related. <laughs> oh, that's actually embarrassing because normally I don't promote closed source projects. Sure. <laughs> but you, people are going to use Puppet. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. End of June. And so I would like, I would ask you not to think about it at, on June the 1st. <laughs> but uh, start as soon as you have some time uh, because I don't know what appears. I mean, many tools just run. That's the experience until now, but I don't know what tools you have. So, um, this is the odd URL for the roadmap that you can find on mediawiki.org. Um, if, if during uh, migration you find things out that aren't documented, it would be great if you took down some keywords and yeah, to help others uh, to do it more easily and improve the documentation. That's a bit weak. Uh, last month we collected all of the scattered keywords and tried to yeah, just to do a little documentation sprint to get more of it uh, together in one place, but there's still stuff left to do or new things occur with new tools. Um, okay, and the last thing is that a colleague of mine, Johannes, um, he's a software developer at Wikimedia Germany, and um, until about the end of this year, he's got some time he can spend on helping others to migrate if tools need adaptations, or if, uh, for example, you are in a multi-maintainer project, you are not the coder, but the coder doesn't have time, that would be situations you can uh, write to me or directly to him and ask for support. And so I don't know how full the schedule will be in, uh, like in 2014. So please, if you would like to him, him to support you, uh, ask us around until the end of September so he can plan this and uh, so this year he has got some time for this. Okay, and last thing, if you don't want to write this down, you come and get my uh, email address on the card. Don't hesitate to write and ask things uh, because I, for me it's quite difficult to find out who are the 300 quiet tool server users that I want to migrate and they don't come and talk to me. Yeah, it's like I write emails into a, into a forest of <laughs> silence. So please uh, come and talk to us. I think that kid is very good candy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
All right, since I've just been asking a zillion questions, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Sumana Harihadeshwara, and Is it I, okay to film you? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll just stand up here for a second. Yeah. So, hi, future. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hi, Commons. How are you? Um, uh, Sumana Harihadeshwara is my name. Engineering community management is my game, supposedly. And uh, so Silka and Corin and Ryan and I and several and Andrew and so many other people have been working to try to make Tools Labs better. I've tried to do my bit a little bit by, for instance, helping debrief the someone who <coughs> helped um, in July on the documentation sprint, um, asking annoying questions and trying to write down the answers and publicize them. And then Ryan says, "No, you're wrong," and then he writes better stuff, and that's how it goes, right? Um, but uh, I, I would really like to be able to help now that, especially now that Tools Labs, you know, it's, it's stable, it's reliable, it's basically the best place now to run your tools. You know, it's better than Toolsurfer is right now, and it's better than your laptop is, and it's more in accordance with Wikimedia values than basically any other host you could find. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would agree with that. Yeah. So, um, great. We have a bath. Woo! <laughs> um, but we know that uh, you know moving environments when you're all set up like it's an annoying thing, and so that's why I've kept on asking. Okay, let, let's talk about what you need. And so I wanted to give a couple suggestions. One is, Silka, do you? I, I want to ask you actually. So, do you feel as though running some like migration sprints where like, hey, this week a bunch of people will get together online and like help each other move. Does that seem like something that you think people would be interested in? Is that something you would be interested in? No. Okay. I, do, do you mind if I ask more? Like, what, what, sure, would, sure. what would actually help you? Uh, well, I, I'm pretty sure I, I can manage it on my own. Okay. Because I'm a developer. Yep. Um, so I, I would actually like to do it on my own time. Certainly. Then spend, you know, do it when With everyone it. else can, right? Certainly. So I don't have anything against it. It's just. It's not for you. Yeah. Right. Okay. Is. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, there's a project written in Perl and SQL. Uh, so, uh, will there be some assistance? Because I'm not a core developer of the tool, mm -hmm. but I'm one of the uh, maintainers. Uh, so, will there be folks that could help with it? Do you think Johannes could be? Is this the kind of thing that Johannes could help with, uh, transferring a, a tool that had been written in Perl, and then of course uses SQL? Yeah. Mostly SQL. Mostly SQL. Yeah. Well, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be. I'm, I'm going to tell you. I, I know that Wikimedia uh, <coughs> uh, Deutschland have placed some resources at the disposal of people, but for the most part, I'm sorry. For the most part, um, unless it's something that requires a great deal of time. Um, Hop on to IRC. Um, there are people there who have moved their tool, and there are people there who uh, would, uh, are, are planning on moving their tool, and this is the kind of thing we can give a good hand with. It, if only because if you start and you just copy everything blindly and it doesn't work, it we'll doesn't be able work. to help you with the error messages. You see what I mean? Yeah. So um, it, it, it's something that if you, if you feel up to it, just like give it a try, and we'll be there to help. But if you feel like you just can't, like you need for someone to come in and rescue, writing to LabZell would be a good start. And then, you know, we'll see. And maybe uh, if, if it turns out that there is no one who just wants to step up in general, we could ask people like Johannes to uh, see if they could help. What, what else could people use? Like what, when, when you're thinking about like training or tutorials or sprints or, you know, in-person meetups, what, what uh, kinds of things? Wait. Um... I found out about that you actually uh, have a database replica somewhere yesterday because uh, at uh, Wikitech or somewhere, uh, somewhere else in the documentation, uh, the status of uh, creating the database uh, replica was still good. It means that they just... Okay. Um, if you'll come to me and show me where on Wikitech it was uh, obsolete, I will fix it right then. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, go ahead. I think it would help if someone could write a, write a detailed story of whole, whole story of migrating the tool and describe what problems they mm -hmm. encounter. Yep, I think partly it exists. Like Magnus Manske wrote down, mm -hmm. 
what he did, what he like, yeah, if what he did not find, find in the dogs. To, to yeah. Go ahead. There's actually two of them. This is a, a, a very good. Um, I just clicked on help, so I think. Oh, I'll okay, no, but you, you probably want to find that. Yeah. Right. So we'll show it to you. Um, so, in a sense, that's a larger thing of we need to get information to you about, like, for instance, we need to get clear, up to date information about the fact that we're ready, including database replicas. We need to get clear, up to date stories, like, a, you know, narratives about how to do this. So, like, wikitech.wikimedia.org is good and getting better. Where do you, like, so you were looking at Wikitech, where would you believe it to look? Like, in general, when you're thinking, I want to find out more, where do you know to look? Do you? Problems, like you mentioned, for example, I have a script that I will be as a Yeah, so the question is, um, a tool that has been written, written a long time ago might have dependencies on things that are now obsolete. I think that's one of your concerns. Um, this is a plausible scenario. This is something that has actually occurred, happened to a number of people who have migrated into, I think even it happened to Magnus Mask. Um, and um, in general, unless you're using something that changes a great deal over time, um, those dependencies are fairly simple to, to manage. I mean, if you run into a problem and you, you say, oh, well, I'm getting this error message, there are so many people who already have moved in their tools that they're almost certain you're going to get somebody who already had exactly the same problem. Um, in worst case scenarios, um, there are people who will help you modify or update your tool. For instance, uh, the Johannes, uh, <coughs> who has this as part of his job for the next several months uh, to sit down and help people who have difficulty moving their tools, or um, in, in the case of that some dependency that's missing that could be installed, this is something that the, uh, uh, that the uh, um, assistant of the tools project will be able to do. If you ask it, if you explain your, your, your requirement in the Bugzilla or on Labs L, will look into finding the right way to giving to satisfying your dependency. Now I'm going to give an example. I know for a fact that we have two parallel versions of Ruby installed, uh, for instance, because uh, between, um, and I'm no Ruby expert, and I believe it was between 1.6 and 1.8 of the language, there were so significant differences that meant that one script that would work with one would not work with the other and vice versa. Um, and given that we had users using stuff written against both versions, it turned out to have been much simpler to simply have both versions available than it would have been to adapt half the tools to use the other. Um, so this is the kind of thing we're flexible about. If you have dependencies or if you have um, missing packages or if you just need help with adapting to the newer version of stuff, this is something you can readily find help for. And I think that the best place, I'm, I'm going to go back to my slide because my slide is so good. You're on a computer that oh, doesn't have oh, no. <laughs> I know, I know I have a slide. The best two places, Labs L, the mailing list, and on IRC, Wikimedia-Labs on Freenode, those are the best two places to raise attention when you have an issue that you think that simply somebody sitting, sitting down with you for five minutes will be able to fix. Those are really the best places. I hope the same goes for Python as well as Ruby. Excuse me? I hope the same goes for Python. The same goes for Python as well. The you same goes for Python. Basically, every scripting language that is in common use. Yes. You had a question? Oh, you want to, yeah, me? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, is it possible to, to ask like a slightly more general, like high observation kind of question? Or not uh, of course, go ahead. Uh, so my impression that for having been on the tool server for three years is that um, there's a lot of good tools written by a lot of people with somewhat poor documentation and a lot of, of so there's like duplication of effort and 
and difficulty of, of, uh, of discovery of what resources are available and what people are doing and so on and so forth. Um, I, first of all, I should say, hey, you, you guys are doing an, an awesome job. Thank um, you. I, my, I migrated some of my stuff over and you, there's been lots of good help available on IRC channel and stuff like that. It's been really, really cool. Um, but I was kind of wondering what your thoughts are on on like the kind of like the bigger philosophy behind Tool Labs when it comes to trying to make sure that it's easier to know what who are doing what and what, what you know where resources are available, making sure that things aren't aren't really duplicated, making sure people document their stuff and things like that. I'm going to point you at this, um, the landing page for Tool Labs. Um, one of the things that will help, it's not going to alleviate, nothing is ever going to alleviate because documenting is something which makes, um, I, I think it makes developers sneeze or something. It doesn't happen often, it's always annoying when it happens and you actually, most of them actually don't want to get any of them on themselves. But the idea remains that we're trying to standardize the way tools are deployed so that it is at least easier to find out what tools there are. One of the biggest hurdles we encountered when trying to help people migrate from the tool server was to just figure out who was on the tool server that needed help migrating. Uh, I don't think there, even today, there exists a complete inventory of all the people who have accounts and all the tools that are running on the tool server. And God knows Silka tried. And God knows Silka tried. <laughs> it, it, it is. There is no central list of tools, and there never has been. Now, right now, all of this is automated. It is part of creating a tool necessarily adds it to the list. Uh, it doesn't force people to document what it does. And if you look at it, you can see that the documentation is sometimes fairly good. Yes? Uh, I'll just briefly mention that the phrase, you know, it mentions all the tools and this includes bots. This mixes in things that just draw from the API and things that write to the API. Yes, yes. Um, there is no distinction. And in tool labs parlance, there is no distinction. Uh, a web tool, a bot, or uh, something that runs on a scripted schedule is conceptually all the same thing. Can you quickly say how you get the documentation in there? You know, yeah, add a dot, dot, Yes, it does. It's in, the, it's in the help file, and you just add a, a HTML in a file named dot .documentation, uh, not dot .description, yeah. dot .description in the tools home directory, and it ends up there. Okay, um, and as you can see, if nothing else, we have an inventory. Um, and the fact that every tool is a multi-maintainer project means that the probability that something really cool lingers in the dark corner because its maintainer has abandoned it and nobody knows about it anymore is reduced. We can't prevent it. I mean, everybody who works on this are volunteer. Um, they have limited time, they have limited resources, and they may or may not feel like documenting what they're doing. But since we, we, we necessitate open source and open data, and we have an inventory, it means that push comes to shove, somebody can actually walk through and see what are those things, what do they do, and we're never going to lose anything to the midst of time. We may scratch our head a little bit figuring out what it was, but we're not going to lose it. So uh, I, I think those are good steps in that direction, and I think you make a very good point, but it's a human problem, it's not a technological problem. So uh, while we want to encourage people into doing the right thing, um, we're doing our best to alleviate the problem. It's something that's not really avoidable per se. But you are correct. This is an important point and perhaps some, some um, sensibilization, making people aware of the necessity of doing this would be a positive. Also, I mean, we, can, we know how to do better. I mean, if, if we have sort of either organizational will or community will, or I mean, if people are interested in having my group actively help on that topic, I mean, we could. All right, um, I believe we're out of time, so unless there's one or two more questions. Yes? What about question? versioning for these bots? Um, versioning, versioning is not mandated. Uh, we do make a Garrett available to all the tool maintainers if you want to set up a Git repo, uh, and we strongly recommend that everyone who has any sort of code on the tool labs 
place them in source versioning and, and source control, um, but we're not mandating it. You are all volunteers. We can't actually tell you, you must do this this way, and you're not allowed back to log back in unless you, you, you start your source control. But it, it is something that we strongly recommend that people do. Yes, Andrew? Can I add something just because somebody ran into this a couple of days ago? We, we definitely provide uh, Garrett hosting for volunteers, but it's a separate track currently from labs. So some, somebody went through the lab sign-up process and thought that that automatically produced a repo. No, you need to request it, it this doesn't, separately. But we will give you a repo, you just have to ask. And so I, I'm looking into ways to make that much more easy. Um, Currently, the way that the service groups work, we're, we'll, we're going to try to make that information accessible to Garrett so that we can automatically have repos yeah, created should, by publishing the button. Create a, create a repo automatically. Yeah, just well, we don't want to create well, repos automatically. We want to have it a, a, the ability for someone yeah. to like click a button because otherwise we're going to have like hundreds of, well, right, of empty right, repos. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 despite the option talking about this, so the point right now is you simply yeah. ask and we'll be just more than happy to give you a repo for your, uh, for your code. Yeah. Um, in our infrastructure. Any last questions? Going once, twice, third. Goodbye, everyone, and thank you for attending. Thank and you for you joining us. Thank you. Also, happy for and, playing, too. And yeah, yeah, look for any of us on IRC starting two days from now. We'll be all just distracted uh, and jet lagged. Three, three days. <laughs> <Okay>. three days. <laughs> All right, I'm looking at wikitech.org. Right? At least I think that's where it should be, right? Is it the tech that we need to go to? Okay. Okay. Yeah, please, 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 please